knowingly or unknowingly, we try to make us relevant, not because to show off, but because if we remain relevant, we enjoy life. If we become irrelevant, if people say, oh, this guy is useless, then life becomes difficult. So everybody at heart, we want to keep, it, keep us relevant. <clears throat> some stage, some people retire and say, enough is enough. I'm not one of those to say enough is enough. I want to keep myself relevant. That's why I don't retire. But I say I am tired, but not retired. Now coming to relevance, uh, it's my all, all my thought process. Please agree to disagree and we can have discussion. So I feel, first of all, we need to be relevant to family. We need to be relevant to the community where we survive. And we need to be relevant to our profession. And those who are working in the industry, they need to be relevant to the industry they're working. So I'll quickly go through these. Family relevance to me is to remain relevant to all members of the family. Then each member should be connected to each other. Then that family is a good family, happy family. And in my family, uh, what, how I became relevant, all my siblings, a large number of siblings, I taught all my brothers and sisters, so they did not need any tutor. So I'm still respected and favored by everyone. They seek my advice and I feel I enjoy sharing with them. This one is interesting, community relevance. Wherever I lived, when I was a student, student community, I was very relevant. I will not say that Mazed knows it. I was a student leader. And then wherever I went, I went to Japan, I found <laughs> Association of Bengalis, came to Singapore. It is interesting, I saw our children, they study a different language, but second language is compulsory. They study either Tamil, or Chinese, or Malay. So I said, no, it cannot be. So I formed a small group, went to the government to allow us to uh, learn Bengali. But they said, no, it is ridiculous. It cannot be done. Your community is very small. A really one very strict man was at the helm. But he said, okay, you try. So he started a house to out house movement with the class, started with 17 students in 1984. You'd be happy to know that now we have 1,000 students. Government has recognized Bengali as the second language, and we are very happy about it. And they're funding us. So that, that way, uh, idea, I formed it. Now I'm very much relevant to the community, and everybody is happy that their children are learning Bengali. Now, in, the, in my professional relevance, when I joined NUS, I, I knew that uh, I need to be at the edge of the technology, research, and development. Uh, it's necessary because I need to get promotions, I need to get students, I need to get publication, and I, I need to maintain my visibility. There I thought that if I do what others are doing, then I may not be very relevant. So I tried to think something which is coming in future, justified it, and I did not go. My field is machining. Oh. I tried to develop something which is micro nano fabrication, micro nano machining. People ridiculed me. Uh, it's very difficult. You will have to have very expensive devices. I said, no, I will do it by conventional machines and I'll do something about it. I will elaborate on that. And luckily, because it's a new area, a lot of publication was very easy and uh, Students like to do PhD with me. So and that way I brought large amount of funding. Singapore government was funding at the same time. I got funding from Japanese government, uh, um, Hitachi, Mitsuto, different Japanese companies. And government, Singapore government was matching their fund. So it was, I enjoyed really my research life. And uh, then industrial elements. When I, I knew that I may have to, I will have to retire one day. So all my research achievements, I had few patents and, uh, and and tried to make them into product. And those patents, uh, foreign companies, one of them, one Japanese company is interested, but the animals did not allow me to sell it. They said, it will give you money for my company. 2003, I got my first patent and the money to, from a company, but I didn't run it. I allow other people to appointed people, they ran it. 
And then when I retired in 2018, I said, okay, I will run it myself. So I've started and doing really reading, reading as, as, uh, machines and elaborate those. And uh, most typical three, type, three machines we have developed, uh, GT110, yes, I will elaborate. It. Just see the next slide, please. This machine is for micro machining. Interesting, I will explain later. This micro machine, it does all machining in one setup. In one machine, I do turning, milling, EDM, ECM, name it, it does it. Conventionally, you need one machine for one process, turning one, EDM one, and so on. I combine them together. That was the thing I easily got a patent on it, and the university was very happy about it. Next, I developed a machine for fabricating nanofibers. Now you see um, nanofabrics are coming, intelligent fabrics are coming, and this, this machine uh, for electrospanta, which makes nanofibers, which is very uh, popular in the market. And very recently, I developed a diamond turning machine, which is very much needed for optics. Uh, there are machines in the market to make optics, but the quality uh, I was expecting was not there. So I ventured into it. I developed a machine and government gave a huge funding with my own power and everything. We have developed that machine. So this machine development and along with process development, I'm still continuing. Now, let me go back to elaborate on my relevance to NUS, how I did it. And uh, this is a small episode. When I was in Japan, uh, I had ulcer and I was sent to hospital for uh, endoscopy. At that time, the tube was very thick. It was 10 millimeter in diameter. It was painful. So I spoke to the doctor, can't we make it smaller? He said, yes, yes, research is going on. You can be part of it. So that inspired me to make things smaller and smaller. Now, as you know, everybody, everything is getting smaller and smaller. And micro-machining, micro microfabrication has become the trend, which I dreamt one day when I presented in India first in 1992, they say, oh, these are buzzwords, we will not survive. But now it is not only surviving, it is thriving very well. Now, what is the, anybody could be able to do it, but as engineers, it is our responsibility to do innovation. At this juncture, I would like to say that this combination in BS, uh, engineers and scientists together, I think we are all complementary to each other. Scientists, they develop the theory and it is our responsibility to bring into a product, make it, uh, bring it to the doors of everybody so that our co combined effort becomes very useful to the society. And if you look at the definition given by Einstein, Albert Einstein, engineers create that which has never been such a huge responsibility and expectation given to us. So we should really fulfill his desire. And if you look at the definition given by the famous scientist, James Missioner, she said, scientists dream about doing great things, but engineers do them. So this matching of two communities really bring in miracles. And when I present this on micro machining and innovation and uh, speakers, one day one, one person told me, engineers make dream come true. So from all spheres, our responsibility to go with innovation, we develop new machines, new products. Now, as I said, um, whenever it comes innovation, it comes, usually it comes from necessity. Now, if you look at uh, miniaturization is everywhere in medical devices, medical tools, and fuel nozzles in biotech, biotechnology, everywhere, everything is getting smaller and smaller. And that is the trend and established trend. And if you look at the application of microfabrication as I highlighted here, everything is getting smaller. <laughs> We're talking about micro motors, micro robots, communication devices, optical connectors, hard disk, everything, everything is getting micro, micro. And not only micro, but everybody demands the quality should be much better because if the accuracy is not there, then all the devices taking the command or storing the uh, memories, um, it will not be correct. So, Precision is the highest thing in micro and nano machining. Now, as, as I moved into ultra precision machining, which is nano, nano machining, and it is very recent, and it is also getting very popular. If you look at optics in one word, all optics, all optical sensors, very much depend on the quality of uh, my nano machining. Uh, and the demand is very high. In micro machining, we're talking about micro accuracy. In nano machining, we're talking about nano accuracy. And the resolution of the machine in micro machining is nano 
in nano machining is in pico and what is the importance of the resolution that is explained later just to give an example the uh, telescope which is nothing but uh, optics and telescope hubble telescope in 2012 took this picture and this web <laughs> telescope took this picture in 2022 look at the difference the depth and width in uh, webs telescope is much better, much deeper than Hubble. So hopefully the machine we have developed, I will elaborate on it later. In 10 years, you'll see another uh, picture which is much better than them. Okay. As I mentioned earlier also, say, an innovative outcome is from necessity. Another aspect, uh, important aspect, if you look at it, you cannot avoid it, you will have to go for micro nano machining. If you look at this scenario, this graph, we want to improve our quality of life and we want to improve our productivity. But at the end, what happens? The resources are getting used up. And if you look at this graph, the trend is that to improve these two, you'll have to spend more energy. And if we do not change this trend, then we'll have more and more COVID and so on in different names. We'll have to save the nature, we'll have to save the energy. So that that makes it necessary to go for micro products, micro machining, nano production, nano machining. Okay, so our responsibility as engineers is we should be able to break the current trend and, and then bring in new things. Now the trend has started. Good news is that and this trend, saving energy has started already. I hope you'll guess what it is actually. This all this television camera. Huh? You know, all these uh, in 1980, which was weighing 1,400 kg. I hope you can guess what coming next. Steve Jobs did the job. He developed a product which is only 200 grams in in 2011, and it does all the jobs. Everything 1,400 kg. So many devices. So much of energy needed. The smartphone has brought it into such a small product, which is so energy efficient. And the trend has started. Now, if you look at the machines, till, till 2003, people are using milling machine, lathe machine, laser machine, EDM machine, wire machine, so what not? So many machines they were using for different purposes, different machining processes. But in 2003, I patented this next product, which is a small machine, only 100, thousand kilogram, one ton, and it, it does every machining and it does it very accurately. I'll show you the examples. Okay. So this is innovation uh, just to change the trend of energy spending. Having said that, I would like to highlight how to be innovative. That is absolutely, again, my th thinking process. Uh, I'll just share with you. Uh, I think uh, from the and basically, I like to like to swim in turbulent water. I always try to go to go against the trend, not because I want, but I think uh, swimming in turbulent water gives you more courage and more, more uh, output. Uh, so I always prefer to choose out, move out of comfort zones. And I have very positive attitude in life. I never say no, and I always have inquisitive mind. I think for all engineers. Uh, if they possess these qualities, I'm sure they will do well. And if I feel, if I fail, I have no hesitation to go to the creator to help me to do these things. Okay, uh, as I told, uh, I chose to swim in turbulent water. An example is, uh, I could have gone for my PhD to UK or USA, but I decided to go to Germany or Japan, but finally I chose Japan because that is land of land of innovation. I knew about it, so I decided to go there. So my whole life is moving out of comfort zone. As you know, there is famous saying: to achieve something significant, you need to come out of your comfort zone. If you look at my life, uh, I'm not boasting it, but I like to take this type of challenge. From Bangladesh, I went to Japan, not to UK or USA, as I had a role to study. From Japan. Uh, after university, I went to a company and I learned what is in the industry. And from there, I came to Singapore University. And from 
retiring from Singapore University as a professor, I have become entrepreneur to start this company, Microbooks. And I'll show you some examples of challenges I faced and how I managed it. And as you know, Japan's transformation from rice paddy fields to high-tech industrial industries, all those things inspired me so much. Japan is the land of innovation, my dream land. Now, what is, why is it so challenging land? As you know, the language is different, culture is different, food is different, research and education, everything is different. I very gracefully, I faced all these things and luckily I overcame all these things. Now coming to Singapore, now look at, uh, uh, in Singapore. Fisher, Singapore was a fisherman's hub in 1960s. Now it is a technology and innovation hub. And uh, if you look at the university in Singapore, where I joined the National University of Singapore, it was an unknown university in 1962, but now it is number one in Asia and one of the top 10 in the world. So all these things are all challenging areas for me. Uh, Singapore in 1960 and Singapore now, what you can see here. And okay, and now let me again go back to the role of engineers, what we can do and how we can be uh, innovative. So basically, we need to be innovative. Uh, and what I feel of innovation is key to survive. If you're not innovator, then someday you'll have to call it a day and take rest. So innovation is the key to survive. And innovation is nothing but solution to a necessary problem. So we'll have to develop relevant products. And again, applying innovative ideas. You should not develop something which dream and dream only never comes to usage. And you will have to improve the efficiency of production, applying again innovative ideas, solving problems which cause ecological and health problems and so on. So all these are given to us. Now there are two types of innovation I feel that one is revolutionary innovation, another is evolutionary innovation. And in case of revolutionary innovation, it brings the technology to a higher level and evolutionary innovation enables the technology to be perfected over time and again by many various cycles of innovation. But again, innovation, evolutionary innovation is important, but cannot be the primary driver. That will not change the trend. We'll have to change the trend by revolutionary innovation. So all innovators should target for that. Just again, just, just to show, these are the first radios revolution, first television was the revolution, first cell phone was revolution. These are all innovation, revolution innovations, but when a, com when a television screen changes from 32 to 36 and 40, these are evolution from uh, black and white to color, all these are evolutions. So you can summarize them saying that uh, revolution innovation is first in class innovation or best in class innovation. You should all target for this, but uh, it should continue with evolution and innovation. If you look at uh, evolution innovation, uh, Ford, what they developed the car plant in 1910, uh, what Japanese did, the whole factory was automated, manless factory, making the same car in a different way. Now, coming to this next, next point, positive attitude. Never, uh, never say cannot be done. Um, this attitude is always with me. I never say it cannot be done. It may be done, it may not be done, but I never say cannot be done. As you know, very famous Bengali poem, Kali Prasanna Goswami wrote, Parivana Ekotati Baliyona Aar, Keno Parivana Tha Bhapaya Kwa. Yes, everybody knows it. Hello, hello, what is that? This is an Asad Dikshan. So I will give some definite examples of innovation in design, since I'm in design and manufacturing. Uh, first of all, we'll have to analyze the problem, what it is. We know that the trend is micro, micro machining, micro manufacturing. So I decided but other processes, electron beam machining, uh, all these very expensive devices are used. But I said, no, we'll have to make it in a conventional machine. We'll have to develop the process. We'll have to make the machine. Whatever is necessary, we'll do to do it by machining. People did not believe me 
but I was determined and I was sure it can be done. And I, by the grace of God, I did it. So my target was to do micro machining, to develop machine tool. But at that time, this high accuracy motion controller and so on was not available in any machine. Process was not understood. Process, when you try to do micro machining, you have to develop hybrid machining process. That had, had, I had to develop. And when you develop a micro product after machining, you need to take it to the metrology lab for measurement. If you take it to the metrology lab for measurement and bring it back to clamp it, then clamping error is much more than the size of the product, dimension of the product. So you'll have to do everything on the machine. Even the machine should have on machine measurement. So metrology should be on the machine. And such a machine did not, it was not there in 1993. I started and uh, I developed it. And then in 2003, I patented it. So why it is necessary and how it is done, I'll take quickly give an example. If somebody wants to have a micro hole, which is which could be, for instance, this hole, which could be 50 micron. So an ex, you take it to an expert who knows electro discharge machining. He'll say, okay, I will do it by electro discharge machining. So he will buy an electrode, which is 45 or 50 micron, clamp it in the spindle and carry out EDM. But this clamping error, one or, one or two micron, will at the end of 200 millimeter will have large, rotational error and the hole will not be 50 micron, it will be 100 or 50 mic 150 micron depending on your clamping accuracy. So to avoid that, to get rid of this problem, the only solution is to make the electrode on a machine, in a machine and then using the same setup, you do EDM. Your clamping error is zero, then you get perfect hole. This is an example, we developed a machine uh, which does turning to make the electrode and bring that EDM tank below it. You see, we get the turning, make the electrode, and bring the EDM tank below, and you do the machining. And then you get a perfect hole. Now, and this is the machine. It has everything. It has uh, micro turning, micro milling, uh, micro EDM, wire EDM, and measurement on it. And recently, we added laser on it. So all machine is in one machine weighing one ton. And it's highly accurate, just to show, uh, its resolution is 0.2 micron and accuracy is plus minus one micron repeatability. Absolutely accurate machine. And if you look at one example of a hole in machine here, 50 micron hole, if you look at the quality of accuracy. So it is like a zigzag machine. These are the examples of 50 micron shaft in machine and, and length is about 10 millimeter. It's absolutely unbelievable. Now the question how we did it, I will explain it later. You know, again, another quality I feel uh, to be an innovator, he should have an inquisitive mind along with commitment, vision and thinking should work simultaneously. And uh, there cannot be any lag, lead or lag, all should be moving together. And I will explain one of the processes, how I give up, developed it. And then uh, I talk about this, uh, attitude, inquisitiveness, commitment, vision, and so on. This is an example here. Uh, recently at the machine I developed of uh, diamond turning. This is a long history. And when I went to Japan to work under Professor Masuko Masumi, very famous professor, he got gold medal from the king for a paper. I'll explain later. And uh, he was with me for one year. I was with him for one year after that he retired. My associate professor took over. So, that problem I wanted to continue. My assistant professor says, so far nobody could do it, don't try it. At that point I gave up, but at least I could not continue. And then uh, in NUS in 2006, I gave it to a student to do it. In 2010, he did it. And 2018, another student from Bangladesh completed the whole project. Very quickly, I'll take you to that journey. And the Professor Masami in 1953 published a paper for which he got gold medal is a breakthrough paper. As you see, um, chip, as you see, when you, those who have seen metal cutting, if you do metal cutting, you have certain depth, which causes the chip thickness. So you can vary it as the chip thickness uh, decreases, your cutting force also decreases, common belief. But he found that when the chip thickness is almost zero, the cutting force does not become zero. On the contrary, when the chip thickness becomes slowly decreases and up to certain at this zone it is never zero so he said 
what is it going on? He found this phenomena, which could bring a new thing. For that, he got gold medal and nobody could solve it. So in 2006, uh, when I was looking for new funding, I proposed that I will do it. And I offered this project uh, to a PhD student, Moon Kang Soon. And I told him, can you find out what is happening? He says, sir, nobody can do it. How, how do I dare to do it? I said, please try it. I will help you. So I said, what could cause the chip thickness effect? And I, I hinted to him that tool is never infinitely sharp. It has some edge roundness. I will not go into the details of it because it is engineering. And, uh, and as you look at this picture, when the tool comes into cutting, this is the thickness of the chip and the tool edge, which we think very sharp, it is not actually. If you enlarge it, uh, so you'll see, I'll show you later, that this chip thickness, and which is A, and edge radius is R. So A by R has something to do with, I asked him to try. So he took it very sincerely. So I said, okay, this is a relative tool sharpness, which is, which armed it as A by R, chip thickness versus edge radius. If you look at the tool, this is the tool, which is used for turning. So everybody thinks it is infinitely sharp, which is not. If you look at blown up picture, this tool has, this is the edge. This edge has a radius, which when you magnify, you would see it. It does really ratio A by R and try to attempt it. This is, as you see here, blown up picture. This is the radius of the tool. And this is the chip thickness. Chip thickness could be very large. Chip thickness could be very small. Based on that, I said, okay, you try when A by R, sharpness ratio is greater than one, sharpness ratio is almost zero, and sharpness ratio is in between. With this, we did finite element analysis. I don't want to take you to that range. When A by R is very large, there are two zones. One is primary deformation zone where uh, this red mark, where material removal actually does not happen very significantly. Uh, when this some of the materials of the chip flows out like this, then this is called secondary deformation zone. Okay. So that is the chip we see comes out and the rest of the material, some deformation takes place. I'll take you to the journey, I'll explain to that. Uh, then when this uh, A by R is approaching zero, actually nothing moves out, nothing moves out. So it is only primary deformation zone, no secondary deformation takes place. And when A by R is somewhere in between, uh, is less, more than zero, but less than one, then something goes out, but not significant amount. So that zone, we try to find out. And we did final element analysis. The result is that when A by R is more than 0 0.25, material flows, it is a normal sharing process, which we teach to the student sharing process. Actually, we teach them sharing and plowing, uh, but now we found another zone. And when A by R sharpness becomes less than 0 0.25, material reverse flow takes place. That means some of the material which tries to escape below the cutting edge, that is caught and flows below the cutting edge, that causes a phenomena which is called extrusion, uh, which is metal forming, but it happens in metal cutting. These are all the stages of um, material flow. I'm not, I'm not going to the details of it. And we have established that uh, when very thin, the material flows below the cutting edge, that is extrusion from there when uh, the chip thickness is very large, this uh, shearing takes place. And uh, this is the two zones, extrusion like mechanism, when material flows below the cutting edge, some of the material and concentrated shear takes place. So now a new, Mechanism has been established in metal cutting, which is extrusion-like mechanism. And that has changed the whole uh, scenario of metal cutting. And you now, uh, more, more details, when A by R is about 0.25, you see very clear surface. As it increases, uh, the surface becomes rough. When it is less, the surface becomes also rough. So that was a wonderful achievement. And from there, whole metal cutting theory in nanomachining started. So these are more experimental results under different cutting conditions on different speeds. And to do all these things, uh, how to be innovative? Let me talk 
talk about the innovators thinking process and uh, actually these things are more appropriate for those who are doing research postgraduate studies uh, but i'm sharing with you i hope I, these lectures are very more important for the students so when you try to be innovative you should always remember uh, fundamentals should be applied so that's why physics comes in if the physics is not clear then you cannot be a good innovator yeah so and the innovator who wants to be innovative should be should have an analytic mind analytical mind and uh, and she should investigate the possible solutions she should not say no it cannot be done he should always think it should be able he should be able to do it and he should he'll have to think out of the box i'll give some examples and his parallel processing he should not be one track that okay this is the solution no it can be some solution which you did not even think about it so his parallel processing process should be on he should look into all the phenomenon whatever could happen should take into consideration and he should be updated with research that means what has been done so far he should know otherwise he may be repeating it or he may do something which is redundant which has already been done and if he's up to date then he can really achieve something i will take that example also fundamentals should be clear as, as i said when i said we can make this shaft usually you take it to a technician who has who is working for turning for 20 years he will say a shaft which is 50 micron 10 millimeter long impossible it's a cannot be done even a lot of uh, machine tool manufacturing companies president challenged me uh, i will shorten that story he said you cannot do it when i did it uh, one one president from tokyo came to see how i did it and it is so simple only thing they didn't think of the alternative they didn't go to the fundamentals because everybody was saying when the shaft is so narrow so thin it will bend but they forget the equation that deflection is a function of force length of overhang and moment of inertia and deflection can be calculated and keeping all these things keeping force very low and length of overhang very slow small anything can be done and people when they think of turning making a small shaft they think of longitudinal turning which is common practice and they think oh it will become narrow and it will fit but what we did, we did step by step from here up to here, the next step from here to there. So it never failed, never got bent. So thinking process, they will think, they'll, they'll have to think of alternatives, different ways based on theory, not by assumptions. Okay, these are the shafts. And next challenge was uh, when the machine was developed, uh, shaft was machined, it was published. One Japanese company came to buy our machine, uh, Panasonic, I can tell the name Panasonic came to buy the machine. They said, oh, 50 micron shaft is very large. I want you to make a hole which is five to six micron and make a hole of 10 micron. That was a challenge. And by the grace of God, we have solved that. Again, all innovative ideas came in. By machining, we can make, we could make 11 micron shaft, but their target is to give them a shaft of five to six micron. That was again, putting innovative ideas what we did is after machining 11 micron, we carried out EDM on the machine because this machine can do all machining processes. By turning, we made this, and by EDM again, we tried to reduce the diameter of the shaft. The shaft was moving up and down, rotating. By EDM, we reduced the diameter. And every stage we, have me we were measuring the diameter of it because machine has one machine measuring device. Finally, we got a shaft which is only five micron in diameter, quite long. And then machine with this, we got a hole, it is 6.5 micron hole. When the student got it, he's also another Bangladesh student. The process has been patented and uh, midnight he called me and I went to see it, I was very happy. So adding innovative ideas, you can make miracles. And the hole is 6.5 micron, such it looks so big, it's only 6.5 micron, accuracy is unbelievable. Now I told about out of the box thinking. And uh, really out of the box thinking, I had a student from Vietnam. I told him to combine EDM and ECM. Just to elaborate, I'm coming to that. Uh, combining EDM and ECM, he said, sir, I did my master's in EDM. It is impossible, it cannot be done. I said, hey, guy, why don't you think consciously that it can be done? So he asked me, have, have you done it? I said, no, I know how to do it. Theoretically, I, I have established it. Why don't you try it? Uh, very reluctantly he tried it 
when you do EDM, electro discharge machining, EDM is electro discharge machining, surface is very rough because uh, material is removed by particles. And after that, they do EDM, which is electrochemical machining, which met, where material removal is very slow, very fine, so you get a better surface. But it is done in two machines. So if it is small product you do by EDM and take it to ECM machine, your setup error will be gone and uh, you will not get the proper dimension. You can get a surface, but dimensions will be wrong, flatness will be wrong. So I said it must be done on the same machine. So reluctantly he believed it and he tried it. Uh, so um, to do that, let me come to this point. So micro EDM is done in non-conductive medium, which is called dielectric and micro ECM is done in conductive medium. And so I said, okay, why don't you try that if you do EDM, do you need 100% um, deionization? He shaked his head, neck and said, oh, sir, yes, I will think about it. So I said, why don't you slowly reduce the deionization and then try and in ECM also you try not 100% ionization, try to have some uh, deionization in it. And so he was very happy to do it. So we call it a low resistivity deionized water. It's not 100% ionized, deionized, it is not 100% ionized. So it's a mixture and mixture combination is uh, deionization to be 78% and ionization will be about 22% within this range. Then you can get do the miracle, you can combine these two processes in one bath, one machine, one process. And you see finally, uh, when you do EDM, and only thing you have to do it very slowly, you do only EDM, you get a surface like this. When you do combine them together, you get a nano finished surface. I show the graph. When only EDM is done, surface finish is 142 nano. When combine them together, EDM and CM, you get only 22 nano. So doing a nano surface by EDM, it was the first thing in the world, it was in the So you'll have to think parallelly think out of the box, never say no. I'm, I tell the students you can achieve miracles. Okay. And then you'll have to be, I tell the students, uh, even all my research colleagues also, that you'll have to be up to date with research. Don't do something which has been done by others, or there is some clue which using that in science, there is some clue using that you can really make a breakthrough. I give an example. And uh, I told one of my students from Pakistan to do ductile mode machining of brittle material. And please imagine a student coming from Pakistan under a supervisor from Bangladesh. So he, I was worried he may think that I am just uh, teasing him because brittle material is brittle. How can you machine in ductile mode? But I told him that, hey, uh, Adif was his name, I, Adif, I'm sure it can be done. Believe me, you'll not be frustrated. You'll be very happy one day when you can do it. He said, sir, how can it be? You're changing the definition of brittle material. I said, no, I'm not changing the definition of brittle material. I'm really taking something from material scientist. From scientist, the result I'm giving you, you'll be very happy to do it. So what is that result? Dr. Lon published a paper in 1976. Luckily, I read that paper. What he did, he did some indentation test on silicon. Silicon bar, and he found when the indentation up to one nano, and he retracts the indenter, then there is no nothing, no mark left. So that means there is a ductile layer on silicon as well. It happens with all, every material, silicon, glass, ceramic, but depending on the material, this uh, layer varies from uh, 0.67 uh, to about. Uh, 3, 3 to 3.5 micron. So he, what he said, he says, uh, he proved that every practical material, no matter how brittle it is, has some plasticity. So that paper I gave the student. So he said, okay, sir, I understand. In silicon, it was one micron. He said, sir, okay, sir, how, how shall I machine something by machining one micron at a time? I said, no, if that uh, only machine one micron, then Dr. Lon should get another degree from NUS but you will have to machine in millimeter. So he got a shock. Um, Lon says one micron, sir, you are saying, I'll have to do it in millimeter. I said, yes, think about it. 
So he thought about it and a few days, he almost gave up. Then I said, no, think about, I, this is again engineering, I hope you'll bear with me. There, is, there are two machining processes, one is called up milling and down milling. I'm not going to on these details. If you do up milling, chip thickness starts from zero. So if you are machining a brittle material, when the chip thickness comes to critical chip thickness, if it is silicon, at one micron it will crack. But imagine, please, when you reduce that feed rate, this feed rate, if you reduce it to this much of, if it is at the exit, if it is, or at the crack, if it is one micron, reduce it to 0.1 micron, 0 0.01 micron, because machining can control in micron, sub-micron. So your, your thickness at this point, when it reaches uh, one micron, its depth, radial depth, will be 100 micron, 0 0.1 millimeter. If you can further reduce the chip, uh, feed, then you can have 200 micron. So then he was very happy and he did it his PhD in two and a half years. He was very happy and it became a very fundamental work. Now material scientists believe that brittle material can be machined in ductile mode. These are the results. So initially he started with a radial depth, which is vertical one, 100 micron and feed rate of six millimeter. He got full brittle fracture. He increased the radial depth, depth to 350 micron feed reduced to four millimeter per minute, then he got partial ductile. Then when he reduced his radial depth to 275 micron, then feed rate of 0.4 millimeter, four millimeter, four millimeter per minute, he got perfect ductile surface. So I'm sure now uh, everybody will believe that even brittle material can be machined in ductile mode. That has brought a revolution. I'll show you later how an unthinkable thing, uh, thing has, is being done now in machining. Mold material has changed, hardness of uh, uh, the molds have changed. And previously, when glass lenses we were all uh, done by grinding, and now machining can do it. I'll show you this example. That machine also we have developed. Uh, as I mentioned, this innovative, uh, uh, innovative outcome comes from necessity. So now, as you know, molds for molding, molds are all made of uh, steel usually all are steel in different hardness and you make plastic products even you can make aluminium products and so on you cannot machine you cannot machine glass lenses glass machine all by grinding but the grinding is a serious problem i'll show you and the lenses are not nice those who are wearing glass lenses they're unhappy so to break that thing we had to develop a titanium mold by which you can directly mold glass so you don't have to do any machining and you don't need to do any grinding. Uh, so we have to develop a machine, which is not the normal machine, which is absolutely much one degree higher than what is available in the market. So this is a machine and this, this is called diamond turning machine because diamond tools are used to cut such hard materials. And with that, we have added another facility. I will explain to that. So all these are for lenses, I will not elaborate. And it is a famous prediction by Taniguchi of Japan that how this machining industry will move in future uh, with this accuracy. He said in 1980, we should reach the surface finish of five nano. And unfortunately in 2000, we are 2000 even 2020 now, we are yet to reach that, and which was supposed to reach in 2001 nano, in 2020, yet we have not reached one nano. I said it's a disgrace to engineering community. I took the challenge and developed the machine which can do uh, one nano. Even we are hoping to reach to 0.1 nano. I'll give an example of this. So this is my latest development. It is going to get a award very soon. I'm very happy about it. Uh, very quickly, I will go through it. The machine movement resolution, that decides the accuracy of surface finish. So far, the best machine in the world has a 38, 34 pico resolution. When the movement accuracy is in 34 pico, you will get a surface finish of about 100 times, which is about three to five nano. So our challenge was to develop a machine which resolution of single digit, and we have successfully developed it uh, in eight nano. That also, again, a challenge. We thought of buying a scale from the market and modifying it but the Japanese manufacturer, only manufacturer in the world, refused to give it to Singapore. So we had to develop our scale, which is only eight pico, 
and now they want to buy it from us. This is a good thing. We have attached so many gadgets with these. Uh, vision system measures all the dimensions of the workpiece, which does not exist in the world. And clamping system, every time it is zero, perfect accurate, that also we have added. And we have added an elliptical vibration device, which replicates the up milling process I explained just now. With that process, you can machine tungsten, ceramic, silicon, everything. And we have developed a tool post, which can be adjusted in nano. So all these things has really, uh, we are very happy to say that has made a big impact in the market. All these work pieces you see here, all are of mirror surface and uh, all these products, all these different lenses you make. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details. Now comes the problem of brittle material. When you try to machine brittle material in a conventional way, then surface looks very fine. You go over fine, mirrors finish fine, but actually there are micro and nano cracks. And when you see it really under the microscope. So we said we will have to bring, we'll solve this problem. So we, we incorporated a vibration device. The tool moves in elliptical path. As you see here, the, the tool moves in elliptical paths. So what happens? It is just a replica, exact nature of up milling, what I explained. Using this process, you can easily machine little material. As I have shown the example, up milling process, conventional vibration devices like this, which is not enough, you will have to have elliptical vibration device, which solves the problem. And if you look at the, we have machine tungsten, people could not dare to do it, where they're machining conventional material, they get four nano um, machining tungsten, we got a surface finish of about four, four nano. So that brought it, solved a big problem. And now in optics, all these things, or the, this machine, its machining process are used in all optics, all functional optics. I'm not in this camera lenses and uh, telescope, what not, everything, LED lights, all these. And these are, these products are very common and uh, we need to use them. Now, this example I showed you earlier that Hubble's deep field telescope gives this picture. 2022, it is much better. And hopefully in another 10 years, you'll see uh, a better picture of this space. So with that, I finish my presentation. Uh, feel free to pass any comment or question or anything. Thank you so much for listening.